This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, a game that offers 500 champions, each with their own skill trees and endless artifacts, from awesome weapons to win caps. Make sure you're quick as using my link in the description. Every new player will get an exclusive welcome pack that contains 100,000 silver, 1 energy refill, 10 mystery shards and a free champion, Slasher. Now back to the video. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. What's up, guys? Um, it's Andy Cousin Three here. Uh, I have not been doing a video on the YouTube channel in well over four or five years now. But uh, I'm back. I'm doing this for a school project. Today, I'm going to be talking about. War of Destiny. Now, I will preface this by saying I'm only going to get to the Golden Age, so if you do know your Destiny lore, um, I'm only going to the Golden Age, like, I'm getting through the whole Golden Age, so this video should not take too, too long, hopefully. Um, yeah. Uh, and I will also say that I am making this at uh, the time of recording is 11.22 at night, and I just had a sudden urge to make this video, so that's why if you're, if I seem a little tired, um, that's why, because I just all of a sudden have this random urge to get on and make this video, because I can't fall asleep right now. Anyways, um, without further ado, let's get into the video, starting with Chapter 1, The Book of Sorrow. The story of destiny begins millions of years ago, thousands of light years away, at a planet called Fundament. Fundament is a gas giant. Fundament was so large that its gravitational pull would pull its own moons and even other planets into its surface and it would crash into its oceans. The remains of these objects would form into continents, and on these continents, the life would be born. The smallest life on the planet was known as the krill. They were constantly under threat upon the harsh world in which they lived. They were, there were many nations of Krill. One nation was known as the Osmian Corps. Their king was about to go through dire straits. Their king was was ten years of age, a very old age for the very brief life of a Krill. The king had three offspring. Zero, Zero the youngest, she aspired the ways of combat and exploration. Sathona, the wisest, who wished to consume the royal jelly and become a long-lived mother, so she and the secrets of the world. And finally, Adorash, the oldest. She was to become the next ruler of the Osmium Court, though they did not know it yet. These three siblings would change the universe forever. Everything began with their father's assassination. Their father was senile at the time. Most Krill lived to be around eight. At ten years old, the king was, dri was being driven into madness. For some, this was at least some method in, the ma in his madness. He would study the sky, raving of moons above fundaments, eternal storm clouds. He was always accomplished by his familiar, uh, accompanied by his familiar, excuse me, a white worm-like thing that was dead but washed up from the sea. He saved the spawnings, and in response to the king's consistent madness, Teox, a mother of the Osmian court, wrote to their arch enemies, the Helium Trinkers, begging for them to kill the king and slay his offspring, offering to rule as a regent for the for them beneath their command in his stead. The helium drinkers happily accepted and slew the king, but they were not but they were not fast enough to slay his progeny. The three fled with their father's familiar and took a ship onto the great oceans of Fundament. Upon its mass they swore in blood that in their lifetimes they would return to the Osmium Court and avenge their father, kill Teox and the helium drinkers, and understand the doom that their father spoke of, as he raved in what many believed to be madness. The sisters were slowly starting to realize it might well be something to be concerned with. The doom that their father spoke of was later divined by Adorash, who remembered that the last words of their father, of her father, said to her, namely, the moons were different and that the laws were bent. He made a sign representing the Zizigi, and it was revealed to Adorash the nature of their doom. In the skies above Fundament, there were 52 moons in the world. But if all of them fell into the correct alignment, 
they would pull in the same direction all at once, and, there, and they would therefore pull the vast water of the Thunderman's ocean into a massive void that they lay. With the combined force of the gravitational pull passed, the mass of water would then be dispensed, like dispersed in all directions in the form of a tidal wave that would swallow whole civilizations, and since a god wave. The quest was now even more urgent. Zero, Sathona, and Alrush needed to not only defeat the traitors, but to save their world and their people from extinction. In their extended travels, they found a great crash ship, an artifact of a bygone era, an artifact of a greater civilization. This was not necessarily a seafaring ship, it was potentially a, a spacefaring one. It was the Needle, and they only found it thanks to the whispering of their father's worm, was now held by Sithona. The dead familiar that the king had always brought with him was apparently able to communicate with her, and with its advice, they held on to the needle instead of selling it. They then took a further two years to not only repair the ship systems, but also to deeply understand them. But as two years passed, Sithona grew worried, she believed that they would not have the time they needed to see the dream of their vengeance realized. It is then that Alrush started that they should stated that they should die. They had long since learned that they could use the ship to charge to the immeasurable depths of the fundaments oceans. Alrush believed that the below the waves close to the planet's core they might find answers. Zero uh, remembered the bodies of the ship's prior owners and how something from the deep in the depths had clearly caused their ruin. Sathona, who had heard the worm familiar, whispered Land's brilliance and agreed with Alrush, and so the descent began. Through the crushing depths and, the, and past terrifying beasts, the siblings ventured until they came to a still place. Here they monitored the waves above, and the, sen and the sensors of their ship stated that their fears of a zizigy were indeed true. It was indeed coming to pass, and it was that it was that moment that they encountered the Leviathan creature as massive as the continents of their childhood, and it spoke to them, urging them to turn away from the depths of fundament, a fundament and from the depth and from the deep itself. The Leviathan's voice was booming inside their heads, massive, forceful, and determined. When finally it was exhausted by the protest of Alrush and Zero, Sedona would state that they would, that they should die. Her justification was completely clear at this point. She stated that she was guided by her father's familiar, this is what had given them hope. Whilst the Leviathan only wished for them to return to the surface of fundament to their short lives and die, and so they continued to dive deep down into the crushing depths of fundament's core. And down in those depths, Alrush found himself standing unprotected on the wall of the ship. But in spite of the immense pressure and heat, she was unharmed. Before her, there were five massive creatures. They were the worm gods, Yul, the honest worm. Zol, the will of thousands, Ur, the, the ever hunger, Ir, the keeper of order, and Akka, the one of secrets. Ancient creatures that served the deep, or as we know it, the darkness. Yul offered Alrush and her sisters a bargain, and told them that the worm gods had been trapped in Fundament's core for Eon by the Leviathan. The bargain was simple. They would be granted immortal life by consuming the children of the worm gods. New face filters on Instagram today. This is my favorite one so far. Nice job, team. Of the worm gods, but they had to always obey their nature as beings. Zero, who would be perpetually attempting to test their strength. Sathona, her cunning, and Adarash, her knowledge of the universe and her expansion, exploration tool. The sisters accepted the bargain, and took the worm god's lava back to the surface where they had all chosen new morphs and new names. Zero, Sathona, and Arash ceased to be, and with that, the birth of the ascendant hive gods, Zivuoroth, Savathun, and Alrix was complete. With Zivuoroth taking up the night morph, Savathun taking up the mother morph, and Alrix taking up the king morph, the three returned to the surface of Fundament, where they fed the worms all the krill that followed them, and killed the rest. The war that brought to the surface eventually engulfed all of them. The, war, the worm gods eventually rose to the surface with the children and escaped the fundaments with the forces of the sisters. They pursued Chaos, the one who portrayed them at the Osmian court, in the fundaments' icy moons, 
On that moon, the war gods discovered that there was another race inhabiting it. They dominated. There was also a 53rd moon hanging above its orbit. Although technically this was not a moon at all, it was the it was a divine presence of the deep polar opposite. It was the presence of the sky, or the light, as we better know. What was this presence? It was the Traveler. The Krill and the Worm Gods undertook a campaign of annihilation against the Armonite, Teox, and the Traveler. Whilst Teox would escape, the siblings of the Osmium dynasty, especially Alrix, learned the ways of the this, sword this lady. They embraced the dark power, making them even more terrifying than the Teox could easily. During the war, Alrix was, was struck with the ideas of pacifism, which enraged the Worm Gods. They believed in the ideals of the sword logic, that life should be tested against life, that only the strong should remain. The worm that Alrex had to consume in the depths of Hominute yearned for war. Eventually, this hunger was starting to gnaw at his soul to lead him back into fray. But even after this, he still offered to parlay with the Ammonite on neutral ground. And it was, it was then that the worm gods demanded Salathun teach him, and teach him she did. She betrayed Alrex. She killed him, but Alrex did not die. Instead, he awoke in his throne room, part of the Ascendant Realms, an alternate dimension where the High Ascendants go when they die. It is only in this Ascendant Realm that he could be truly killed. And whilst Alrix was recovering, Sabathun went to the neutral ground and poisoned him, killing the, rel the representatives of the Ammonite that were meant to meet at the parlay for peace. Before the war was won, the Leviathan came forth from the depths of the moon slain by the forces of the deep in a final battle of fundamental means that shook the world to the core. After burrowing out of the worlds they had conquered and multiplying at a great pace, the Krill would take up a new name as a species which they would refer to from from the moment until time ended. They strengthened their resolve and battled each other for over 20,000 years, and then at last they set out stronger. Set out on a campaign of geno mass genocide across the universe, fighting many different species and bringing them all to their end. Finding them unworthy of their sword logic's challenge, the test that, that stats life should consist of them. However, they encountered a problem. As Alrix discovered that, they, that the, more the more they fought, the more hunger of the worms expanded. And so they faced the great threat that they would not be able to satisfy their worms' hunger. This put the supposed immortality that the worms that the worm gods have offered him into context. But beyond just this, it set the stage for a greater threat that was looming over the horizon. An alien empire known as the Ecumen came to the base of the power of the siblings. They had all diverted all of their resources into a campaign of utter annihilation against the hive, responding with overwhelming force whenever Albert, Saladun, or Zebo Arak appeared. They knew exactly how to defeat them. This was no coincidence, because they were being guided in the method of destruction by Teox, the traitor mother. Eventually, the siblings were beaten back so much that they were left with no strength to go on fighting. They gathered in Alrix's throne room and assessed their options. But whilst Zirugu Arath waited to wanted to retreat and gather strength, and Sabathun wanted to beg the worm gods for more power at this point, Alrix knew the sort that the logic of the sword better than any of them knew that they needed to aggressively proclaim the right to exist through war and death. As is truly affirmed, a plan of action was, was devised. In this plan, Alrix slew his two sisters and by, and by the sword logic became more powerful by proving his might over them. With their true, with the, with their true deaths under his reign, Alrix went to Akka, the worm, of, the worm god of secrets, and told him that he wished to receive the secrets of the deep. When Akka said he gave no secrets, Alrix Alrix rebuffed the Worm God and stated that giving was for the sky, and that he had to take what he wanted, even if it meant killing Akka. And so, Alrix slew Akka the Worm God, and from this ruin, he pulled the secret of communing on the world. He reported the, that the secret of, he recorded that secret on a, sec, on a series of tablets known as the Tablets of Ruin, and hung them about, about his waist. Following this, he used the secret to enter the deep within Whilst his speech with the deep was not recorded, what is known is this. When he emerged from the deep, he pronounced that he was Alrix no longer. Instead, he was Horus, taking pain, and that he had the power to take life and make it his own. At, 
It was at this moment that Oryx went out into the universe and unleashed his new powers upon the vacuum forces, namely his ability to take, which allowed him to abduct enemies, corrupt them with darkness, and return them as complement slaves, bound to his will and given new abilities thanks to the power of the sword life. It was too much for the Ikumi, and eventually they were pushed back and slaughtered. It is here that Oryx enacted two peculiar rhyme of resurrection. In spite of their deaths, deaths being true, both Zebu Arath and Zabadun were returned to life, each of them respectively summoned back with the war and truth. The Ikumi were er eradicated so completely after thus, that only in the Books of Sorrow or in the Mind of Teox, who yet again evaded their capture, did they even remember. All, all note of them, all memory, no trace was wiped from the universe. Following this, Oryx would have moments in time to commune with the darkness. Thanks to the rituals recorded on the tablets of ruin and the darkness, which shown terrible, dreamlike hallucinations replicating his childhood and teaching him to be yet more brutal to embrace the sword logic even further. Oryx also learned that Zebo, Roth, and Sabathun were at this moment conspiring to leave him stranded on his expedition into the Despite this, he brought back, and what he was brought back, he endeavored to bring sons and daughters into this world so that he might love them and kill them, but they would all be empowered and strengthened. The first of these children is Crota, the Eater of Hope, whose strength was unparalleled and who would one day rise to be one of the greatest champions of all. The second was Nathos, who was feeble, who was feeble in strength, but strong in mind, more of a wizard than a knight, unlike his demon brother. The third and fourth of his children came from a single larvae, cleft in, the, cleft in two by Oryx's great sword, Wilbur. The larvae became tw the twin daughters of Oryx, the death singers Ur Anuk the Weaver and Ur Halak the Unraveler. Oryx's children accomplished many great deeds, and their stories were numerous, from the creation of the Death Song to the destructions of the whole axiom of the universe. Oryx's daughters were, in particular, highly accomplished. One day, they were cutting a wound in reality when they, when they, and were proceeded to die inside it. When Oryx inquired as to why, they said they would seek to create an oversoul as a way of both hiding their deaths as well as creating a death impulse capable of defending their throne world if need be. Oryx told Crota that he, would, that he should observe his sisters and try to learn cunning from them. And so Crota decided that he should experiment with a wound in reality. However, Crota tore open a wound in reality. It was thanks to Sabathun, who had manipulated the wound, then a, part a partially mechanic form of life poured from it, a race known as the Vex. The exact origins of the Vex and, their na and the nature of their power is shrouded in a fair detail of mystery. But they spilled forth from the breach and began to invade Gorks' throne room. Before Crota could respond by destroying them all, the Vex mind manifested known as Coria, lay transformed the sword life. With this knowledge of the particular universe in which they stood in their hand, the Vex began to slaughter Oryx's throne acolyte, and by the and by right of conquest and sorrow, slaughter had gained a foothold and presence within Oryx's throne world, as they invaded the force obeying the logic of the nude space that they had found. In spite of Ur and Ur Halak pulling sword stars from the sky and creating devices known as annihilator totems to stop them, the Vex would press forth it was only as Cory abducted the children of the Worm God and discovered that by praising them, it could gain even more power, that the Worm God here stepped in, telling Oryx to set his house in order. Oryx returned home and slew the invaders, pushing them and Coria back. As punishment, he took Crota and threw him into the Vex gatework, saying, Come home glorious, and die to them. Crota would accomplish this, going on to be a legendary demon of the high, tearing down his opponents only allowing a few to survive to tell the wrath of the Osmium Banners. But even though Crota had succeeded, there was still a problem. Orbs' throne world was now left with a tear inside of it. A tear that left him weak to a counterattack, and potentially sabotaged by one of his sisters. And so, before his court, he declared that they would transform his throne world as part of the Ascended Plane into a physical ship in the material world. This was the Dreadnought. It was built not only from the parts of Akka's corpse, but with the incredibly terrifying mind-bending mind power of 
works in his life. Fort worked in tandem to create what was effectively a paradox. The throne world of the ascendant plane pushed into physical space, a streaming, gaping hole that was no reality. But regardless, Quartz's power was so incredible that even breaking the laws of physics themselves was nothing towards his might. But this accomplished, Quartz's throne world was secure, and now, and now it was time to deal with it. He used his dreadnought to attack a flotilla of ships that was guiding the Nekia thought the ship, a great vessel that he believed contained the location of a place of immense light known as the Gift Mass. When he boarded the ship, he found Coria and squarely defeated it. Even as Coria tried, tried to simulate him and his power, Coria was taken, and the Orcs presented its remains to Sabathun but a single change from the typical human namely that it had a small fragment of independence. Here, the hive took their time and prepared an assault on the gift, on the gift mass, which they had, which they have now found. The civilization surrounding this great place of light had been passed over by the traveler, which had been, which had altered the gravity of a black hole so that the worlds around it might not be devoured. They would be provided warmth and substance, and sustenance, and their civilization would grow. And as a monument to the light. Traveler erected a gift mass, a greater spear-like structure that jutted from a black hole and was filled with the power of light, a gleaming monument rising forth from a singularity filled with the energies of life itself. Dad just dropped that Rocky, IO guards are around me, then they try me GG, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we landing greasy, enemies around me, pump just hit for 30, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish to devour this light. As the deep was moving in the direction to devour the whole system, so too would the hive naturally be in Vanguard. They marched upon the gift mass, killing the Harmony and its occupants and the Ankara, the great dragons that lived among them. But as the gift mass was being devoured by Orcs' brood, and as his victory was certain, Sabathun departed her brother, and that he needed to distance from each other. She took her moons and her brood, and they fell into the black hole that the Harmony lived around. Never be heard from again. In the same stroke, Zivu Aras took her broods and war moons and fled into the night with a similar purpose. Both on their throne realms became distant and inaccessible, and he was left to follow them. It was here that Oryx reaffirmed his choices and his belief in the darkness, but Oryx also pondered the question of what should happen if he should die. He summarized that the one who killed him should be the one who, understand, who understood the universe in a more complete manner than him. He believed that he would only be killed by something mighty, something that he would, something that's, that had some greater knowledge of his sword life, perhaps, or perhaps with some clever trap. He therefore decided to lay out a mass, a means by which he would, might survive even if he was destroyed. Within the Books of Sorrow, he created a map to create to a weapon that exemplified everything that he was. That in a certain way was him if created. And the being that was that wielded this weapon and used to become mightier than both of them would be Oryx living in the pawn and Oryx deduced that they would become one and the same. A means by which they could be truly become immortal, immortal, even beyond a true death. The weapon would not see construction for generations, but when it was, it was a, it was it would be a weapon of malice. And it would be the ones and we would be the ones. The tale of the Osium dynasty would not simply end there. Oryx's second son, Ophrys, who was a born lesser being of wisdom, as opposed to strength, wished for more power and knew that his strength was in, that, was in that of his mind. He went to the worms and he petitioned them, asking them for the knowledge of all, the origin of all things. All the worm gods denied him except one, Zul, the will of thousands, who was lesser than his brethren and saw that in time he would be prey for his peer, Yu. Gave a portion of his power to the young hive priest and taught him the art of bringing forth life from death, necromancy. But the power of Nocturus had been given, not taken, and this infuriated him. He saw his son's ideals as heretical to the very ideals of a sword logic and a betrayal of his own dynasty. He cast out his son and removed all, re all records of him from the hive archive. The only record of Nocturus that remained was a single statue before the altar of war. To defy it in its permanence. 
There are some of the er these are some of the earliest tales of the universe's death. Tales that predate even our own history. But they are a small part of our grander cosmic war. A war between formless and form, between the deep and the sky, between the dark and the light. A traveler with the, pri the divine presence of the sky would continue onwards, evading the hive in the darkness, seeking out the call of worlds with the potential to achieve its light, for those with meaning in their war, and thus the traveler would make its way to the elixir. They would suffer much the same fate as the Harmony, the Ammonite, and the Anchorman, and they would suffer at the hands of the darkness and the night. Their home was destroyed in an event they called the World War, where they left to make a great exodus and abandon their home, following whatever trace of a traveler they could. The great machine, as they would call it, would however find a new place to set its roots. The Elixir transforms their once noble society into a barbaric traveler. The traveler had begun to take root above a system on a planet far apart. The name of this planet was Mars. The name of the system was Sol. In the year in the human Gregorian calendar was 2014. And in this year, it found it. Chapter 2 The Golden Age. In that year, 2014, humanity witnessed an unknown artifact entering the orbit of the atmosphere with the closest neighboring planet of Mars. It was clear for all to see, humanity was no longer alone in the universe. This strange object was an immediate concern to the powers of Earth. Fifteen months later, with cooperation, planning, commitment, humanity set its response. The combined powers of the People's Republic of China, the Russian Federation, and the United States of America led to the creation of the most famous space voyage known in human history, the voyage that would become to known as Ares One. So it was that one tank knot, one cosmonaut, and one astronaut, Chow, Malakalova, and Hardy, all set, out, all set out on a journey that would change history. Mars, of course, is a planet with no to no atmosphere, and yet with the Aries one crash crash down, it did so in the middle of the storm. The breath of a god as the wind buffeted them back and forth before landing. This was not some strange coincidence, this was the work of the artifact. As they took their gear and trekked across the Martian surface, they could start to see the artifact coming to the end of the horizon. As they crested the, at the ridge ahead of them, they saw it was they saw it completely for the first time. It was at this moment the first Martian rains began to pour, and the actions of the object were made clear. It was terraforming Mars, and something else had become clear as well. The alien presence was not some conqueror or some terrible invader, but was instead benevolent. They called it the Traveler, and its arrival in Seoul would change humanity forever. This would be known as the start of our Golden Age. The Traveler's divine presence would, would, boom to our, would be a boom to our solar system, and under the radiance of its light, Seoul, Earth, and humanity would blossom. The planets and moons of our solar system were terrified, with worlds like Mars and Venus becoming habitable planets with diverse ecosystems of life and stories of resources. The moon became the way station for all the systems, sending resources from Earth to far off colonies in the methane oceans of Titan, or the garden world of Mercury. But perhaps the most profound change of them all was the people of Earth themselves. Human lifespans tripled, and the fundament ethos and the fundamental ethos of our society changed and evolved. Not only were we more intelligent and live longer as a species, we also put that knowledge to use instead of squandering it cured a myriad of diseases that had haunted us, but study into any number of emerging scientific and philosophical fields, and we extinguished the old hatreds of mankind's past forever. Humanity created vast monuments throughout the solar system as the traveler worked to seed it for us. From the great Martian city of Freehold to the new Pacifica archaeology of Titan, from the solar research stations of Mercury to the Ishtar, the Ishtar Academy on Venus, and we came to, began to flourish in every place in that system. Beyond merely the places we laid claim to, there were the remarkable accomplishments we attained in the sun. With the great minds of, of the Clovis Prey Corporation and others like them leading the way, bringing forth some of humanity's greatest inventions. The rise of one of these most notorious and most important of all, of all the war mind rescued me. 
computer tasked with the mandate of defending humanity from extraterrestrial threats or sky shock alerts. Rasputin was an intelligence of such immense might that it was capable me, of predicting and calculating threats before having even encountered them and of devising a solution to them so that they might never ever threaten humanity, even if they did enter the solar system. Rasputin was armed with a vast of vast defensive array of, rep of weapons and doomsday devices that could scorch black the skies of a thousand worlds in the name of humanity's defense, should the need arise. But this was the only great invention of Clovis Bell. This wasn't the only great invention of Clovis Bell. They also created many incredible technologies, such as the intelligent nanotechnology known as SIVA, which, which could be commanded to construct anything imaginable. This made a particularly valuable technology to those colonists who were heading outward towards the stars as it would be spontaneously used to create anything as a prefabricated shelter to an oxygen rebirther if given the correct direction. Furthermore, by developing relic iron, a mysterious new material was studied on Mars, the Clovis Great Corporation discovered an entirely new state of matter where data was completely free to the restraints of physical matter. This state was known as Ingram. And allowed any idea imaginable to be stored. And of course, there were the Exos, a project of, Clo of Clovis Gray that allowed humans to transplant their consciousness into a mechanical body and live on past the point of normal human life expectancy. However, there are hints in programming in the past lives of Exos that give us an idea that they may have been more violent in nature. The Exos dream of a place where they were born, the Deep Stone Crypt, and whilst go there, and while some go there, peacefully through a field of gold, golden millet, and most of them dream of the almost endless battle to reach the tower where they were born. But this is not to say Clovis Bray was the only one researching remarkable technologies for humanity or making incredible discoveries throughout the solar system. The researchers of the Istra Academy of Venus at this time discovered the ruins of an ancient civilization that predated humanity by billions of years. These were the Vex. And the ruins that they discovered were those of the vault of glass from the infinite steps. The Ishtar Academy and Collector would make it their responsibility to study the Vex and the constructs at any place possible. As our golden age magnified our glory, humanity's greatness shone like a beacon in the night, illuminating the very stars themselves, convincing us that our destiny was to not remain on Earth like our ancestors, or to continue their petty wars. Instead, was to reach forward and upwards and to grasp with sorrow the very majesty, majesty and grandeur of the universe itself. We flew out into those stars and spread our wings. Alas, that we let our hubris get the better of us. Not all were so ill prepared or foolish, though, whilst most sat in complacency beneath the glorious bounty of the traveler. Some, such as the three families of the Black Armory, were beginning to craft a phase technology weapons so they might fight back or defend themselves. A noble effort, but tragically, it would not be even close to stopping the climax. As the centuries of the Golden Age passed, the war mind began to detect something far beyond the reaches of the system. Something dark and terrible. Something that spelled our doom. Something resp Rasputin's responsibility was to defend humanity into, into an end. The Exodus program was created. Colonization effort that involved thousands upon thousands of souls all being loaded onto colony ships and sent outward toward the stars. But in spite of this titanic effort by Rasputin, and in some minds, such as Malahide, in spite of the valiant efforts of General Chen Lenshu, in spite of the, everything humans would attempt to accomplish before the end, it would not be enough. As the vessels of the Exodus program began to reach farther out to the, out the stars of the, old, of the solar system, Something terrible and dark swept them, swept them back in the other direction. The war mind raised its mighty weapons that were strong enough to shatter the might of stars and responded to the threat with the full fury of its arsenal. But alas, even this was not enough. The darkness had found our system, and in doing so, I found the traveler. Doom was upon us, the golden age was ending, and thus the collapse. Thank you for watching this uh, video. It might be a little boring video, but you know, hopefully uh, I'll put some 
edits in the video to make it you know, not so boring. And yeah, I know I stuttered quite a bit. Once again, it's now 11.55 at night at the time of ending this recording. And you know, it's probably not the best idea to be recording at night. But, you know, you're, I, it's the only time I got the drive and motivation to do it. So. Yeah. Now I'm going to spend the next however many hours trying to figure out how to edit this video. Anyways, thank you for watching. Um, you guys have a great day, and I'll see you all later. This is a message to Quandale Dingle. Please stop messaging me. Go to hell.